Okay, I can see everybody now. A uh, couple of things, uh, some safety things. There, the escape hatches are at the back, <laughs> and there is one at the front. Uh, but welcome to St. Wilfred's Church uh, for what is going to be a wonderful evening. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank Ludger for allowing this to happen, because that's quite important. But also the people that have helped put this together, David, Caroline, Rebecca, to bring this evening together tonight. Now, a couple of things. There will be book signings afterwards. And there will be a question and answer series when Michael has finished the presentation. All of the profits that are made tonight will be given to two places. One is St. Wilfred's Church, but the other one is a local charity called Leicestershire and Leicester and Rutland Headway. It's a charity that I've come to know over the last two years very well and they've been very supportive of me and my family. And it is a charity that if you're not aware of, it deals with people that have brain injuries. And they are a fantastic charity, so some of the money we've made tonight will go to that. So, I think we're about ready. I'd like to welcome a really, really nice gentleman, Mr. Michael Wood. Thanks, Robin. Thanks a lot. It's really great to be back in Kibworth. Um, we have been back a few times over the years, but lovely to be back. Um, it's hard to believe it's 12 years now, 12 years since that series went out. All those very jolly kids who starred in the show are now, are now either doing jobs or at university or whatever. It's incredible to think. There's two new big housing estates in Kibworth. New bits of Kibworth history have been turned up. I'll mention those later. Um, anyway, it, it's really nice to be with you for this, these very good causes. Thank you for supporting them. Uh, I can remember from the time that we filmed the... Um, the race for life it was, wasn't it? Some of you will remember um, how generous Kibworth people are with their charities. 63,000, I seem to remember, was made over those two days. Um, I was the uh, presenter and writer of the Story of England series, but I must mention tonight that uh, Rebecca is here as well, the producer-director who was the brains behind it. She always hides her light under a bushel, but she was the person who kept the whole thing going and, uh, and should get a lot more credit, well, more credit than anyone for the way that it turned out, um, as women usually should. I hope, you, <laughs> I, I hope you agree. Series went out in 2010, uh, a different age, isn't it? The idea was a very simple one, to take one place through the whole of British history. Um, or, to put it the other way around, um, to tell the story of the nation through one place and see how the great narrative, the national narrative, um, impinged on and was affected by the single place. And the idea was to involve the community in that as much as we could. Uh, the clubs and the schools and the charities and the societies, the people themselves would be involved in, and engaged in uncovering their history and tell it. We dug test pits. I'll show you those in a minute. We mapped out the school fields from medieval documents. We, we went to the National Archive in Kew uh, on a bus to, to look at great volumes of, of poor law records from the 1830s and 40s with letters from poor Kibworth weavers um, uh, that had never been examined since that time. Um, we even asked uh, the people of Kibworth to read their own historical texts. And sometimes that was absolutely fantastic. I can remember so many of those, but one in particular, I remember Ben Davis's dad, Nick, reading in quite a calm monotone the horrendous... Uh, passage from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle from 1124 when 42 thieves, so-called thieves, were executed, hanged on Croft Hill by Ralph Bassett. 
And there were many trustful people who said many of those suffered unjustly, says the chronicler. And a very bitter year was that. Oh, gosh, fantastic. Um, we made the series in a single year. And, of course, we had to film what happened to us, what we turned up. So, in a sense, you could plan, but in another sense, you had to film what turned up. And often that was unexpected. It was incredible fun and, and quite moving, too. In fact, it <laughs> sounds corny, but I, I, um, I still get a lump in my throat if I'm on the train going to Leicester or Nottingham and we pass underneath Kibworth Bridge on Station Road where uh, Woodford, the great chronicler of Victorian Kibworth, and it's a fabulous book, um, says the kids used to hang over the parapet and as the steam trains rushed through and the smoke went whoosh, they threw their hats up in the air. And uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, the dear old... We, we were... It was fun, but there are real benefits and, and there's a real point to doing history in that way. It's not just fun. History from the bottom up, not the top down, from the people, not the rulers, from the... Uh, the provinces, not London, uh, that uncovers things in a different way, as you'll see. Um, we were slightly concerned at the beginning. I, I remember that, that not everywhere it was on the BBC. And would people in Cornwall or Ulster or Wales identify with the good folk of Kibworth? Uh, um, we shouldn't have worried at all. The, the response was great. And I can remember a couple of years later, uh, filming in Elgin in the north of Scotland and this huge red-faced Scotsman with a great Dane came marching up to me slightly intimidatingly I thought have I done something wrong and he said you did that series on Kibworth <laughs> and, and I said yeah and he said great people great people <laughs> and so um, the independent newspaper called it the most innovative history series ever made for television and, uh, and it was put down as one of the events that over the whole year had contributed to the happiness of the nation so I hope all you, all you Kibworthians are, are, are pleased at the, the impact you had um, and it spawned all kinds of projects English Heritage and um, Historic England did two big cycles of projects, All Our Pasts was one of them where they were uh, giving out millions of pounds to local history grants all over the UK, starting, of course, with the 60,000 that they gave to Kibworth for the Kibworth Trail. So it, it was a series that had a, a real impact and, and, uh, and still does. Well, it was repeated last month, I think, wasn't it? Um, now, I'll, I'll come to why we chose Kibworth later, or we can talk about that in Q&A. But first, I'm going to show you a clip of the first day, the very first day. We put an, an ad in the parish magazine and an ad on Radio Leicester. And I, I can remember still the sort of strangled <laughs> tones at the other end of the phone of, of disbelief as the, the reporter at Radio Leicester said, Kibworth? <laughs> A whole TV series in Kibworth? What on earth are you going to film? And, and uh, that made me slightly nervous as I approached the first day. Um, we'd asked everybody to turn up at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, summer Saturday, in the, the old school hall for an induction meeting which would be headed by Carenza Lewis of Time Team. Carenza was our uh, friend and, and uh, the, the orchestrator of the archaeology. She was the one who brought in all the other archaeologists in who would help us on this. And she was going to basically tell an audience like this, you know, this is what you've got to do. This is how to dig test pits. Um, meter square, meter deep. Measure them every 10 centimeters, map what you find, then take the next 10 centimeters. Uh, all supervised by archaeologists. And I can remember our production manager, Sally, saying uh, uh, before the, the, the people arrived, uh, do you think anybody, anybody will turn up? <laughs> And I tried to look confident and said, yes, of course they will, yeah. But you never know. You don't know. Um, would they turn up? Well, two or three hundred people turned up that, that, uh, that morning. 
And when you take into account their families and their kids and all the friends and everybody who gradually got involved in the project, quite a large portion of the village in the end, or the villages, I should say, got, uh, got involved over the whole year. There was a second question that morning. Will we find anything? I again tried to ooze confidence. Yes, oh, in fact, everything, you know. Um, but in the back of my mind uh, was, what if, what if we don't? Um, and it reminded me of the meeting that I had when I was first pitching this idea to the BBC. I said, we're going to take a village. And it's this village in Leicestershire. We're going to follow it through time. And, uh, and they said... Uh, well, why, why this? And I said, well, there's great records. They've got, you know, the Black Death and the Peasants' Revolt. And they sat there rather stonily and said, well, what else? <laughs> and completely off the top of my head, whoa, it's got everything, you know, Civil War, there's highwaymen, there's suffragettes. There's, I had no idea that, <laughs> that these things w w would be there. Um, but it's the serendipity of history. In fact... Um, the, the highwayman was a last minute Andrew at the Coach and Horses pub phoned us up pretty late on in the filming and said uh, you're not going to believe this but some Australians have arrived in the bar whose ancestor was a highwayman in Cape and was transported to Australia <laughs> <laughs> and Rebecca said Andrew keep them right there <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, when is your flight back to Australia? <laughs> Australia? Do you think you could just hang on for a couple of days? And, you know. but, but that was the way it worked. So, that's enough of me gassing along. Let's look at the first clip from that first weekend. It starts with me and Carenza in the coach and horses. Dave. This whole three villages at the moment is complete darkness really in terms yeah. of what we know about physically what's there, archaeologically what's there, what yeah. really was going on. If we can do 50 test bits yeah. that just throws the lights on. It's knockout isn't it and we've got the phenomenal documents for this bit. Not bad for, for that. The Home Guard used to practice here and there were some unspent bullets uh, just around this area. So. You know I'm hoping to find something good. Oh, 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 Take measure, oh, oh. just there, darling. Where? Yes, I suspect it must have been bigger originally. Oh, you're doing a great job. Hi, everybody. That's a bit of clay pipe, for example. So that's that again. This is sort of ordinary Victorian, early 20th century household. That's that sort of precursors to cigarette. He found like shoe heels and belt buckles and stuff. <laughs> We found some pieces of a pot. Apparently that's the tibia from a sheep. At the start, our clues were just broken bits of pottery, but it's amazing what an expert can get out of them. What we've actually got is a pretty much every major pottery type going back to about 1450. Fantastic. Um, oh. Earliest bit we've got is that, which is Midland Purple, so that's about 400, 1450. It could be as early as 1350. It's one of those pottery types we haven't quite got nailed down, but it's certainly post-Black Death, yeah. This yeah. place has been occupied since certainly 1400, I'd say, and maybe even 1350, because you've got this, which dates to about 1470, 1500. Uh, that, which is about 1580, 1600. That's about 1680 to 1700. That's 1720 <laughs> to 1750. And then you've got the 19th century stuff as well. So, oh, bang, we've got the house. Yeah. 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 So you've got a five, six, 650-year run of pottery in these trays. And then one piece got us all excited. Uh, yeah. That is looking good. That looks very nice. Let me just dry it off. This is a nice bit where That's we just finished. That's what I think that is. Oh. It's a piece of really, really beaten up Samian ware. Um, first, second century. I cannot but that's Roman. It. I'm because pretty certain that's Roman. By the afternoon, we got more Roman. Fantastic. Yes, okay. Oh, let me come round. Found some tea, free tea thing of the layers. Yeah. And some Roman pottery. Yeah, there. Roman pottery, two you... pieces. Roman. Yeah. Wow. So did you did you dig those up yourself? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so has it been fun? Yeah, it's been amazing. It's been really fab. I've never seen these two concentrate so much in the, in our lives. Roman pottery. 
Wow. Well, oh gosh, it's all beautifully bagged and. Yeah, that is great, isn't it? Fourth century, maybe. So it was only the first day, and we already had Roman, Iron Age, Beaker people, and prehistoric flints. Okay, big bones. So how's it been, Richard? I've kind of lost the will to live, to be honest with you. It's, uh, <laughs> it's been... <laughs> Yeah, that's natural clay, that with iron pan in it. You'll be delighted to know you can stop. But of course, serious archaeologists just put the kettle on. Back in the coach and horses that first day, we already knew that people had lived in the village for thousands of years. Fantastic. The more you know the village, the more you find out about the village, the more intriguing it gets. And you don't realise the heritage that a village like Harcourt or Beecham has. I had no interest in any of this before you all came, so it's been really a revelation, hasn't it, I think, to all of us. The bit I like was the, the little bit of flint we had, the little chipping. I just imagine the little Stone Age man sitting on top of our hill, just chipping away and looking at the same similar view. Oh, it's such fun, isn't it? When it comes. <laughs> Great. I don't, don't need me talking. Let's just watch the films. Um, I mean, I, this is terrible because watching these things, I know I'm going to digress from the strict line that Robin says I must take to be on time. But uh, um, watching that, yes, Paul Blinkhorn, the, the, the pottery expert, single earring, the black t shirt, the shades. Uh, going from one location to another on his motorbike became an unlikely sex symbol. Especially, um, I'd, I, I'd, I'd talk to, uh, to Rebecca's friends and go, did you enjoy the series? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But suddenly they had a rather unexpected interest in Ipswich wear, or, uh, you know, uh, like the pottery expert, they said. Anyway, um, let's, let's uh, turn to the PowerPoint, Dave, if I may. Um, it's out of that promo, if you haven't seen the series, you get a feeling for the, the feel of the series, if you like. It could have been any place, I guess. Um, Bill Hoskins, the great W. Hoskins, who did the making of the English landscape, said you could probably take any place in England, and we should have got some documentation and you could tell this, this story through them. Kibworth happens to be one of the couple of hundred that are really, really brilliantly documented. In the case of Kibworth, from 1200, uh, especially Harcourt, but not just Harcourt, uh, you've got everybody who lived in the village. You can trace great changes in history. You can see what happened. You know, we, we historians generalize about the transition from the feudal order of the Middle Ages to capitalism. But what does that mean to ordinary people on the ground? In these documents, you can see it. You could see in the 15th century the people of Kibworth negotiating to move to cash payment of their dues rather than being forced to labor by their lords and so on. So um, it was those documents that led me to Kibworth. The idea was a very, I'd been thinking about for many years and of course, you know, being an Anglo-Saxonist, I was kind of tempted by those nice villages in the home counties in Hampshire, which have very good Anglo-Saxon records. But it, there was something about Kibworth that, um, you know, it's, it's got the A6 running through it. It's kind of... Uh, uh, but there's something ordinary about it. It's not Ambridge or a Hovis advert, is it? It's, 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 it's what it is. It's where most of us live today, in bigger or smaller agglomerations. <laughs> Um, but it had all those elements, um, and, uh, and in the end, I went with Kibworth. There it is. Next slide. And, and you see, immediately you see patterns, if you, you know what to look. You know, this is looking on the... There's the railway going through Kibworth. Beecham on the left, Harcourt on the right. The A6 weaves... You can see there weaves underneath the, the railway. Um, 
not the, the great route in the Middle Ages, the A6 was, the, the road to Market Harborough was made in the 12th century. You see the pattern of fields from the time of the enclosures in the 18th century. And yet, there, can you see the ridge and furrow? Rig and furrow. That's how a farmer here pronounced it to me. What I call the deep bone structure of England. You know, that, that's for a thousand years, that was the way people farmed in the open fields. And uh, uh, it doesn't take you very long to start to see the signs. Next one, please, Dave. Uh, a little bit closer, you can see here the railway running through the centre of the picture. Um, there's the bank. There's Beecham, Harcourt up there, and infill and all that. But the, the character of the two places is quite distinct. And we were on a bit of a steep learning curve, to be honest. I remember going to see dear old Betty Ward, who, who's in the film, and she said, you know... Um, you need to be careful about the distinction between Beecham and Harcourt. Uh, uh, she said, uh, um, I mean, no Harcourt person would ever go through the Beecham door into the church. <laughs> Not even for a marriage. Not even for a funeral, she said. And, um, uh, you know, Beecham was the radical Kibworth, Stockiner's Kibworth, uh, behind which, to my amazement, a much deeper proletarian history. The unfree peasantry w were in Beecham, and Harcourt were probably free people, well, I'll show you, even before Doomsday Book, um, a deep division. And uh, when you read around it, Vicar here in the 1860s came from Merton, of course, because it was a Merton... Merton Parish and uh, later became Bishop of Bangalore he's one of those typical Victorian can-do kind of chaps you know. and you can see him arriving here and getting his bearings the, the Leicestershire fellow he said has a rather strange sense of humour not a little grim at times he said, <laughs> he said I attended the parish vestry meeting for the implementation of a sewerage system in the village. And the, the people of Harcourt um, refused to have the sewage systems mixed because they didn't wish their effluent <laughs> to, be, <laughs> to be joined with the effluent of Kibworth Beecham. And you think, you think this is incredible. I thought, what, what have we got into? <laughs> you know? and, uh, but actually, the funny thing is, uh, ever since we filmed in Kibworth, and I, I used to do some talks about Kibworth you know, when the project was fresh. And, and you'd sit in a village in Cambridgeshire or a library in Ely or whatever, and, and people would tell other stories of these double villages very close to each other who, from the Civil War, had never spoken to each other. You know, I can remember distinctly, I can even remember the names of the villages, um, doing a, a talk at Topping's Bookshop in Ely. And somebody stood up and said, have you ever been to Stetchworth and Dulling, Dullingham? And I said, no. And he said, oh, you, should, you know, Kimber's got nothing on this. One was Viking, one was Anglo-Saxon, and they still don't marry each other. <laughs> you, know, you think, God, you know, this is England. This is England in the 20, 21st century. But um, uh, anyway, I'm rambling already. Next one, please. Yeah. It, you know, delightful... The, the infill itself had all sorts of stories. The housing estates. Just take, let's take the next one, Dave. Yeah, the council estate. We filmed this in the last episode, um, built just after the war, reminding us that Kibworth's also got a wartime story of the, the, the prisoner of war camp of Italian prisoners, you know, one of whom married a local girl. Um, the land girls. And and the housing estate immediately coming after the war, on which there were many lovely stories to be told. So next one, but we were starting off knowing nothing before the William the Conqueror's survey of 1086. No records survive for Kibworth uh, until, um, until 1086. The only building that we knew pretty much had existed before that time, this church. Um, mainly 14th century, as you can see, although the great tower fell in the 
1831, was it? But um, dedicated to St. Wilfred. There's a little pattern of those churches across into Nottinghamshire and probably 8th century in origin. But with much more interesting prehistory underneath it, as we'll see. Next one. Okay, so there's half a dozen uh, references to Kibworth in the Doomsday Book. This is the survey done by William the Conqueror in 1086, the conquered land of England. Who owns what? Who are the lords of the manor? What are their assets, their resources? How many peasants? How many slaves? How many freemen? And so on. That's what Doomsday Book is. It's a gazetteer of the conquered England. And um, there are six entries for Kibworth divided between the different manors within the village plus Smeet and Westerby, all part of Kibworth. Um, how the Normans... Uh, how the Normans who took this information down managed to turn Kib Kibworth into Cliborne, is it? Or Kibborne? Or, uh, I don't know. But just to give you a sense of what there was, you can see there that in the very middle of it, six slaves, ten villains who are semi-free peasants. This is just Harcourt. Six free men, Sokemani. Um, four semi-free peasants, Bordars, and one Frankie Gainos, a Frenchman. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can imagine the Kibworth jurymen who've got to report their, what they own to the Norman assessors going, <laughs> We've got one living among us. Um, next one. Uh, so that's where we started. We knew we did have clues to the deeper past, but nothing concrete, really. Um, and we just whizzed through these. That lovely summer that we, we did the test pits, and then 55 test pits to begin with, and then a few more targeted um, interrogations of specific landscapes. Next one, Dave. Um, <laughs> uh, the meter square, meter deep pits. What are they all doing now? Any, any of those kids here tonight? Probably all too busy. Um, next one. <laughs> Giving up the will to live. I was slightly worried about um, uh, asking people to dig up their prized lawns and the, you know, but they were, they were very willing to do it. Next one. And then on the Sunday afternoon, everybody returned to the coach and horses and delivered their, their two days of work to the team of archeologists. And this is what they found. Okay, next one. Oh, yeah, um, sometimes. Um, Joan Pillingham here in her house on Main Street, some of the finds were really surprising. Um, late Anglo-Saxon pottery, around the year 1000 perhaps, in quite an abundant quantity, quantity on the top of Main Street. It was, that was a real, a real plus. Um, next one. And this is, how it, it, this is how it pans out. As you can see, this was dependent on the volunteers. So you've got a big cluster in Smeaton Westerby. This is all Kibworth Parish, of course, and a big cluster around Harcourt, but not so many uh, test pits in Beecham, uh, although the border between Beecham and Harcourt, of course, is above the railway. It, we wondered whether it was partly that it was a summer weekend and a lot of people were on holiday. But if I had a chance to revisit this, and I'd love to revisit it if it were possible, I would definitely uh, be targeting more of Beecham. So if you live in Beecham, watch out. <laughs> um, uh, those are the initial 55 test pits. And let's just see the next one. Yeah. So let's start. We found stuff earlier than the Romans, but this, this is the Roman stuff. And actually, these were the preliminary um, assessments. And we did find a couple more Roman finds. One up near the, just over the A6 in Harcourt, and the other one on Station Road uh, between the church and the, and the railway. 
Um, and that, that's, that's the Roman. Now, this is really, our knowledge of this has really changed in the last few years, interestingly enough. And, and the building of the two new housing estates at Kibworth has contributed to that because they had to have archaeological investigations of the land where the houses were to be built. And an amazing expansion of our knowledge of the Iron Age coming into the Roman has come from that. And what we only guessed, you can see now, is it's quite an important Iron Age to Roman country settlement. But we found some really in fantastic stuff to go with this. Next one. Um, the clues that we, the, the small clues that we had when we went into this include this one. This is an illustration from Nichols's History of Leicestershire, the early 18th century. The, t the church before its glorious 14th century tower fell. Um, but he mentions that on that site, major Roman finds have been found in the past, uh, especially underneath the old rectory on the right, where a large quantity of intact Roman vases had been found, and very, very likely it was a Roman cemetery. And other Roman finds, when you started to look about, had come up, um, including, tantalizingly, a stone inscription with a Latin text, which was not recorded and is now lost. We don't know where it, where it is. That would be really great to find. But, next slide. Um, interesting things are recorded by Nichols. This gold coin of the Emperor Julian, only two have ever, ever been found, was found uh, just in disturbed ground on the street in Kibworth Beecham. So, there's interesting clues. So we put all these together after that first the first dig and next one uh, and we mapped, this is Harcourt we mapped where Roman stuff had been found in the past and this is one of those things where you, you just play on a hunch and uh, the top marker on that we decided to go for that field and we asked the Hallerton group, who had found the amazing Iron Age Hallerton treasure, we asked them to survey that field. Next one. Um, and we had a really great couple of days out there. And next one. And lo and behold, this is what the survey turned up. Uh, very complex series of Iron Age uh, dwellings, uh, and, the, and the trenches of a Roman villa. That, that there is a, the dugout remains of a Roman villa with arcades running around it, little, little galleries. Um, and suddenly the history of Kibworth started to take off in a way that we never imagined it might. Um, a populous late Iron Age into Roman rural settlement. The next one. Um, and that drew our attention back to another feature of Kibworth's history, which you will all know about, the Munt. Um, that's the old... You can see where you are, probably, the, the, the old A6 running off, the, which is Main Street. The new A6 going straight through. And that circular feature there is the Munt. Um, played quite a role in the in the history of Kibworth right through to the 20th century. Ellen Wilkinson addressed the Jarrow marchers from the top of the Munt. Um, all through Kibworth's history, it's been there. Um, uh, next one. And in the mid-19th century, there was an excavation of the, the Munt, which is a big tumulus. Still, go and have a look afterwards. It's a big tumulus. And fragments of pottery were found, and in the base of the tumulus, a stone-lined burial of the Roman period with Samian ware, fragments of what had obviously been cut, a, a, la a lamp stand that had been put in the tomb and so on. And from that, you could pretty much see that a, a potentate, a, a late Iron Age Roman period potentate had been buried there. So within the kingdom of 
the Coriel Tavi, the, the British kingdom which had been taken, which centered on Leicester, this was probably um, an outpost. Next one, Dave. Uh, and of course, also, we held a history day uh, in the uh, old school hall and, uh, and metal detectorists brought in all sorts of other things, including these finds of late Iron Age coins. And suddenly, along with Roman coins, suddenly a, a new history started to develop for Kibworth. Next one, um, with, even with the names of kings, Dumno Coveros, Vepo, the son of Kor. Well, it's probably an abbreviation, but... but um, and next one, uh, and those could be connected with the find of the Hallerton treasure nearby, of course, a stunning, stunning treasure from the, um, the Roman transition period, you know. So this region starts to become very important in, in, uh, in archaeology for the first time, I think. Next one. Let's move on to what used to be called the Dark Ages. I kept the title for the book out of sentimental reasons, but it's just out in a new edition if you're interested. Um, and suddenly, the rich possibilities of the Roman world seem to go. People aren't using pottery, probably. Uh, only one piece of uh, migration period, they used to call it, 5th to mid-6th century pottery was found unbelievably under the car park of the coach and horses. <laughs> <laughs> they started that Saturday morning and I, bought, I went back to the pub and I said, Andrew, what are they doing to that? And he said, we're doing a test pit under the car park. I said, oh goodness me, Andrew, you're never going to find anything there. But, next one, um, there it is. And, and next one, and Carenza started looking through this very unpromising debris with this kind of orange sludge from the building of the A6. And then next one, and lo and behold, slag from firing of pottery or metal, fragments of pottery, and in the middle you can see a fragment of an Anglo-Saxon migration era bone comb all in the same level of the pit under the coach and horses. There was some suggestion these might be put on display in a little case, case in the coach and horses. I don't know whether that's happened. But, um, and that, of course, that takes us into the era of the Anglo-Saxon migrations. I think we can still talk about them, even though they're over a long period of time and a very slow change of society. But uh, next one... Um, uh, and it matches now with stuff that was found since we did our films. For instance, this grave of an Anglo-Saxon woman was found up on Carlton Curlew Road uh, with these uh, adornments, clasps for her cloak. Um, so you start to be able to trace the Anglian, probably rather than Saxon, migrants who came into these territories after the fall of Rome, mixed with the local population, probably came up the Welland, uh, and then up the minor streams that lead up to the ridge on which Kibworth lies. Uh, the beginnings of a different society, although, of course, most of the population will remain uh, British in origin, in their, in their DNA, if you like, even though you get linguistic change over the centuries. Next one. Um, and, and in the films, we did a, a sequence with Pete Little, who's a doyen of La uh, Leicestershire archaeologists, uh, with the, the extraordinary um, grave of an Anglo-Saxon woman of that period, which was found in the neighbouring parish of, uh, of Glen. Uh, it's in the Jewellery Wall Museum, and I do recommend you to look at it, because all her jewellery, everything was with her. She was about 20, um, uh, rich and very significant little adornments and stuff, not of high, high level of society, but probably middling level of society. So we're starting to understand uh, who the people were who came in and start to change the names of the villages and so on. Next one. Um, so y you can get to a point where some sense of the deeper roots, Iron Age, Roman, 
and the beginning of the Anglo-Saxon migrations had come out of our test pits when before we knew nothing. Next one. And again, it's a, a dark period afterwards and we found only one piece of pottery from, uh, from the period, from roughly the 6th century to the 8th century uh, at Smeaton Westerby, but it was a very important piece of pottery because it's Ipswich ware and uh, no fragment of that ware had ever been found in Leicestershire at all, I think, before this. It's the stuff, it's high quality stuff which is used to transport goods like salt on the salt ways th through Anglo-Saxon England. So it's, it's, it's a little indicator. And a little indicator too, finding it at Smeaton Westerby. Smeaton is the tun of the smiths, uh, the metal workers, adjacent to the royal estate at Gumley where the Mercian kings used to stay. So um, a little hint perhaps of what was going on there too. Next one. Now, as for Kibworth, um, this is the, the heart of Kibworth. It's named after an Anglo-Saxon, an old English leader, Kibba, probably in the 8th century. The, the name Worth is an Anglian word that comes from uh, enclosure. And the enclosure of Kibworth is probably the enclosure you can see on the early maps which is the enclosure around Kibworth Harcourt, as you can see, with Main Street is already there. Can you see um, the church where we are just there? Um, that's prob that probably represents the enclosure of uh, the early English, the Mercian Lord of Kibworth, Kibba. Next one. And around that time, probably the field systems began that uh, are recorded in the documents in Merton College, Oxford, who've owned this place since the 1200s. You see the North Field, the West Field, the East Field. Um, all of them were three field villages. Uh, Beecham had its own fields. Westerby had its own, uh, Kimber, uh, Smeaton Westerby had. But uh, there's the map of Kibworth. So that pattern is probably also established in the Anglo-Saxon period between the, the 8th and the 10th centuries. Next one. Uh, and in the films, we actually went to Laxton in Nottinghamshire just to try and show you how that actually functioned, you know, that um, uh, how the strips were administered. It's the only place in Britain where you could still see that. Next one. Uh, and the next one. Yeah. Um, and then, as we, take, as we go up the levels of the, the meter-deep pits that everybody's digging, we come to the mid-8th to the 11th century and the Norman Conquest, and, and we start to get quite major concentrations of pottery, at least in Kibworth Harcourt and, and Smeaton Westerby. Nothing in Beecham, but that's probably just the accident of survival and the fact that our pits were limited there and a big find of pottery up on uh, the corner of Main Street in Kibworth Harcourt um, in Joan Fillingham's garden. I, I suspect an important Anglo-Saxon, maybe the Thane who had succeeded the earlier lords of Kibworth, lived there. Next one. And then we get to the Norman Conquest and the, the, the data that we already have. From then on, we can start to move with the evidence. A divided society, of course. A slave society, maybe as many as 20% of people were slaves. Certainly 15%. Maybe 15% are actually what, free men and women. Women, quite an important part of the, the, the free workforce. Um, so the majority of the people of England and of Kibworth were semi-free or unfree in 1086. And the story of the next four centuries is how they gradually freed themselves of the burdens that were imposed by their lords. The next one. Um, and just a little tailpiece on the Norman Conquest. 
Um, go back to the Munt, because, of course, uh, there it is in the middle, you can see. Um, and let's go to the next picture again and go back to that map. Um, recently, the Munt has been properly mapped. And the great expert in Norman Mott and Bailey Castle says it's probably was the prehistoric burial mound was converted into a Mott and Bailey Castle at the time of the Norman Conquest. It's a wonderful spot. Stand on the top, probably before the era of the, the public houses along uh, Main Street, and you could see all the way to Leicester. So, so maybe a beacon place and everything else. And therefore, the Frankie Genus, <laughs> the Frenchman in Doomsday Book, that would have been his base there, imposed on the population of, of Kibworth. Next one. Uh, and uh, out of the, the maps, the Tudor maps of the, the village, for the first time, if you keep that in your mind and you look at the pattern of the, the strips, the fields leading to the fish ponds and the top of the picture, then next one, you get the first picture of what at least Kibworth Harcourt might have looked like in the 11th century village map in the 11th century. Um, the church off the picture, of course, probably a chapel, um, uh, a horse mill, so horizontal stones pulled by a horse, um, the slang, the great uh, um, passageway where you lead your ox teams out into the three fields, um, kilns, the black houses of the free population and the white squares down at the bottom of the unfree. So it may be, it may be that the um, Kibworth Harcourt was more of a, uh, you know, had more free people and that Beecham had none at all at that point. Next one. Now we move into the light of documentation. Merton College, Oxford. Cutting quickly through the story, in 1265, Simon de Montfort, of course, his base of power was here in Leicestershire, was defeated and killed by, um, uh, by the royalists. And revenge was taken on his followers. And Sayer de Harcourt, who owned Kibworth Harcourt, was compelled to sell up in order to pay his reparations to his lord. And in stepped Walter of Merton, who was a an ecclesiastic who wanted to found an Oxford college. So the Oxford College, Merton, was founded using these confiscated estates. Next one. And in the wonderful library at Merton and the archive room, probably the oldest library still in continuous existence in the world. Next one. Um, box after box of the findings of of the archives of the different villages, Cookson in Oxfordshire, Pontyland in Northumbria, and Kibworth. From this moment on, Kibworth Harcourt, although there are documents for Beecham, uh, is probably the best documented village in, in England. Next one. And uh, we had a lot of fun with these documents. The biggest disappointment, of course, was um, with... 700 years of documents, nobody's really gone through them all. And when you phone around on a project like this, when you've only got a year, and you're hoping you'll find some friendly expert who's prepared to dive in and really analyze the particular years for you, um, very few people are even capable of doing it. And it's a huge academic project which would probably take an a generation or two to actually um, publish the Kibworth documents. So we could only sample. Next one. Here we are, 1280, Kibworth Harcourt. And you close, close in on it. Next one. And here's the people of Kibworth Harcourt. Uh, some of the families at uh, the top, the Gilberts, um, the S Sylvesters, the Sibyls, the Browns, people who the Poles, people who've been in the village, would be in the village for the next 
many hundreds of years, and sometimes the name still survives in families in the immediate neighbourhood around Kibworth. And, and, and the stratification of society, the cottagers here, here um, semi-free peasants in 1280, with Robert the broker, the brokers are the people who go around the, the fairs, they go down to Lutterworth and places like that, buying stuff that they will sell in the village. And down here, the lowest level of Kibworth Harcourt, um, uh, Robert at the well, um, Richard at the, at the thorn tree, uh, Roger the miller, and Alice the washerwoman. Uh, and this kind of data, when, when you really examine it and you take the, to produce a survey of everything you can imagine would give you an unrivaled view of one English society, but it's just never been done. Next one. Uh, the mills, of course, the mill sites still exist around um, Harcourt and Beecham. The mill mounds, ex three mill mounds exist as well as the surviving mill. Next one. Um, and I put this picture in because Alice and Matilda Starr. Of course, by, by this point in the films, we were, that's their name in 1280. Uh, uh, by the time we were this far into the film, the people at Kibworth were really getting into their characters and who they would... Uh, and uh, uh, Alice, Alice and Matilda Starr from the 1280 survey, that's their modern incarnation. Uh, yeah, next one. Uh, and uh, society booms in the 300 years after the Norman Conquest. The population goes up about three times, maybe six, maybe more million. Uh, and, let's, and we found that in the ground, in the next 10 centimetre level of the pits. Next one, the, yeah. Um, first of all, this is what the village probably looked like in the 1340s. So you can see the, you see the strips have been subdivided because there's so many more people living in the village now. The free tenancies going up to the top and the lesser people down at the bottom and, and bits of the common land that the... the, the the passageways between the, the gardens and the houses are being filled up because there's such a pressure of population. Next one, and, and sure enough, in the pits, we found it. You can see, even on our very rough sampling, look at the population growing up to the point of the Black Death in Smeaton Westerby and Kibworth Harcourt. Just not enough data on, on, um, on Kibworth Beecham. And then everything, of course, is hit by the Black Death. And, and remarkably, in the Black Death, uh, Kibworth has the highest casualty figures in, um, of any village that we know of so far. About 70% died. Uh, next one. And it's all there in the court rolls. <coughs> Almost minute by minute. April the 23rd. 1349, 42 tenants are listed as dying in the previous quarter, you know. And those are only the tenancies. They're only concerned about the people who have to pay them the money. They're not talking about their wives or their children or their, uh, you know, their dependents, let alone people who haven't got land. 42 tenants in that period. Um, cl uh, give us a close-up, Dave. Let's have a look. Yeah, the polls... Uh, family had been in the village, would be in the village for about 500 years and four branches of the poles existed in Kibworth and three of them were wiped out at this time. John Church, the, the, um, the warden, uh, had taken over as parish scribe from his father and he'd buried his father, he enlists his father among the dead that year uh, as well as all the other members of the village. So an absolutely catastrophic blow um, to village life, which um, you could see in the, in the pits. Next one. And you can see the contraction. It's clear, isn't it? You can see the contraction after the Black Death. Uh, the population probably went down, well, even by the 1550s, it was only up to about two and a half million. So that's the extent of loss. It's, it's gigantic. And it's not just a single outbreak in 1349. It's, uh, there's about five major outbreaks till the very early 1400s. So um, the economy, the population, 
maybe morale incredibly depleted by this, this ginormous event. And we picked up very little pottery in our 10 centimeter level for that period. Next one. But then, hope is eternal. Human beings are incredibly resilient. And, and, uh, and in the next period, the boom happens again and the population lifts to six or seven million before the end of the 18th century. And it's there in the pits. Smeaton Westbury doing very, very well, as you can see. Harcourt, um, clear evidence of the rise of the population. In these pits, of course, you can't see the Civil War or the Wars of the Roses or anything like that, but what you can get those from other sources. This is the actual material life of the people of Kibworth. Next one. Um, and we'll go through that. Next one, please. Yeah. Um, and here's the pottery dating to the 19th century. That, that 18th and 19th century, you can really see with Harcourt how the, the old A6 uh, had become a, a major route from London to Leicester through Harborough. And that's where, through the 18th century, the great row of public houses all along Main Street, which have virtually all gone now, haven't they? But you know, I think the Bobberley restaurant was one of them. Uh, but we did a test pit in one of those gardens and you literally, this level, you picked up... It, you could crunch your way through the amount of throw-outs of pub pottery, you know. <laughs> I mean, plates and dishes and pipes and, you know. Okay, next one. And just summing up what we did, um, we did... Tra we did walking surveys of the open fields as well because the medieval people leave all sorts of things in the open fields and what they throw out with the manuring and so on uh, and, and found all kinds of things next one um, which Chris Dyer helped us with who's the great expert on, in the world really on, on the life of the medieval peasant he was at Leicester um, we found all sorts of oddities this came up from a metal detectorist who found it out in the fields, I think, which is a love token, poor bon amour. Uh, we looked at the old photographic archives in Wigston. Next one. Um, what did the streets look like in the beginning of photography? Could we find anything more about the, the history of the houses, for example? There's Main Street going down to the, the great old house at the corner. Um, next one. The way of life of the people that continued with horse ploughing up to the Second World War. Can you believe it? Um, next one. Rose Holyoke, I recorded uh, um, her. I don't think she was in the films, but we recorded an interview with her. She'd been a land girl in the Second World War and, uh, uh, and also became a tractor driver when a new tractor came to Kibworth. You know. Next one. Uh, and we did house detective stuff. Um, my colleague David Oldershogo was saying this was the inspiration for the kind of house through time idea. You know, uh, we particularly focused on this one, which is called the Manor House, but was actually the bailiff's house for Merton College, Oxford. And you'll see, if you walk down Main Street, you'll see a, a stone plaque naming three rebuildings of the house from... 1500s onwards, and we found two more rebuildings going back to the 1320s and identified the, the, the medieval house that lay underneath it. Yeah, next one, Dave, thanks. We'll skip that, because I'm going to... Oh, no, go back to that. That's an interesting point. Um, <laughs> I want to get us on to the next clip before I overrun. But, and through all this is the rise and fall of the families of Kibworth. And... Uh, and some of the family names run from the 1280 survey right the way through to the 17th century. And then probably in other villages, uh, strands of the family DNA carry on. And uh, among the free peasants at the top, for example, in the 1280 survey, uh, are the Browns. And it's a very, a very common name, but um, they're very well documented and... If you take them on, I think they're at the top of the page there, just on the line of the top. But next one, um, 
we were able to trace the Browns as drapers. As Kibworth became more, you know, the economy became more diversified in the late Middle Ages, and the connections, especially with Coventry, became really important. It's an important textile town. And the Browns became drapers. And to our astonishment, the story started to unfold in a really rich way. As the Browns, one branch of the Browns moves to Coventry, where they call themselves of Coventry and Kibworth. They still keep property in Kibworth. Uh, they have very interesting religious affiliations, which I better not go into now. But, um, and, um, and subsequently, they move into Earl Street here in Coventry and, and in the 15th century. And lo and behold, the early photographs of Coventry, here's, their, here's where they lived. And then they moved with their drapers' connections. They're drawn to London. And they become uh, civic leaders in London. So you've got them in the guild books in Coventry and in London. Uh, and one assumes probably still around today if we could follow them. But these stories, almost every family has that kind of story. Yeah, next one. Uh, before we finish, Nicholas Orme, who's the great expert on education in the Middle Ages, came down to look at an incredible discovery. Um, in the history of Kibworth, written in early 1960s, they talk about the school box and the documents that were in it. And I went to Robin in the record office in Wigston. I said, well, what do you know about the school box? And he said, no. Oh. I said, it must have come to you, Robin. He said, we'll have a look. And he phoned up a few days later. He said, you're not going to believe this, but we found the box. And the documents go back to the 1340s. And it was simply handed over to us in the early 1960s when the school closed and moved to a different site. And, uh, and it's never been catalogued. Next one, please, Dave. And sure enough, there it all was. Grants by farmers, um, grants of land whose income would later sustain the school and teachers and education in Kibworth. And, and the income for those lands still sustains, helps sustain uh, Kibworth High School today. Isn't that absolutely amazing? Next one. And next one. Uh, we did another series of test pits in different places to try and pin down a few more great events. We located the camp of Civil War soldiers um, down Main Street. And next one, please, Dave. And when we came to the 19th century, we even tried to, when the village becomes very interestingly um, diversified with a big population, a lot of shops, uh, connections once the railways started in 1856. And uh, we looked at the Market Harbour papers and got the programmes for some of the concerts that were done in, in Kibworth at that time. And we re reconstructed one of the concerts concerts in the village hall. Next one. And next one. Please sell no more drink to my papa. <laughs> needless, needless to say, these, there was a strong moral me message to these, these concerts. And next one. We took the kids out on their, went, we went with the kids on their First World War I battlefields visits to follow the, what had happened to the boys from Kibworth. Next one. And next. And I've got to put this in. This, um, this is my favourite document from the whole story. Um, Second World War. It's a typical Kibworth enterprise, this. This is the, uh, the Kibworth News and Forces Journal, produced all the way through the Second World War, sent out to more than 400 people from Kibworth who fought in the different theatres of war all over the world. And it invited correspondence and contributions. It was the welcome link home to all Kibworth families. And, uh, and in it, 
one issue, I wrote this down, it's so, so brilliant. This was the Christmas greetings one, which had a photo of May, May Holyoke as, uh, the, as the uh, Lady Kibworth. And it included a poem from a Kibworth chap uh, who was serving in Iraq. And the poem was called Baghdad Blues. I want to feel the rain again and mow a tennis lawn. I want to mess about in boats and watch the bitter dawn. I want to scurry home again as quickly as I can and settle back in Kibworth and be an ordinary man. <laughs> it's just so great. It's a wonderful document. So I think I'm almost through, to before, but I'm time to show you a final clip, I hope. Um, uh, and of course, the Chronicle is the successor to that wonderful magazine in, in the days that we were filming, still hand produced. Next one. Um, Kibworth still maintains its connection with Merton, of course. The Merton Choir has come up and performed here. And, um, and also, next one. Put this shot in. It's the, it's the, um, the, mark, the, the race for life, the run for life. Just to remind us all that from the 14th century till today, Kibworth folk have always had a very, very strong sense of, um, of charity. I'll leave you before I show you the clip with these two lovely pics. The uh, assembled folk of Smeaton Westerby and the next one, <laughs> um, the, the, um, after our planting of a, a time capsule and the end of the series. So finally, um, Sorry for whizzing through so fast, but it gives you a flavor of what we were trying to do. Uh, I've chosen a, a final clip from one of my favorite sequences in the whole series. When you do films, it, it's not just one thing. It's, films are a combination of pictures, of course, of sound, sound, words, and music. And it's the putting of them together that creates the emotional feel which in the best films gives you another dimension than just mere facts. And this sequence, I wish I could show you the whole thing but I can't, um, but it starts in 1900 with the, the Jubilee of, uh, of Victoria, 1897, sorry, the Victorian Jubilee and it takes us through to the suffragettes and amazingly we did find suffragette from Kibworth, as I foolishly promised the BBC. Um, and it emphasizes uh, that culture is the making of the people, is made by the people as, as much as is made by the rulers. And that, of course, our rights were all hard won by the ordinary folk of Britain and still need to be protected and fought for. So, Dave, can we take this last clip? And be just as when they celebrated Queen Victoria's 60th Jubilee in 1897, the people of Kibworth, like those of Britain as a whole, at least most of them, had shared in the material benefits of industry and empire. And by good luck and good judgment, England had avoided revolution. But other trials lay ahead. The village celebrated the 1897 Jubilee that June in the streets, in the church, and here in the village hall. Tremendous things have been achieved over the 60 years of Victoria's reign, and a justifiable pride in all that comes leaping out of the pages of the local newspapers. But with it, a shadow on the horizon, an unlocalized anxiety, the century was coming to an end, the rain clearly coming to an end soon, and a sense that progress, perhaps, was no longer assured. 
In 1905, a march for the unemployed from Leicester to London came through Kibworth. Working people had found their own voice now. And they had their own heroes. And none more so than the proletariat of the proletariat. Women. Half the workforce in the industrial age as they'd been in the 14th century. In 1905, still less than half of men had the vote, and still no women. The response was the women's suffrage movement, the suffragettes. The Women's Library in London, the greatest collection of women's history in the world, holds many of their records. The suffragettes united middle class and working women all over the country. And they even drew women from our village, like Nellie Taylor, who lived in Smeaton Westerby. Nellie was from a very respectable background. Her father had been mayor of Leicester twice, but somehow she was drawn into the women's movement in Leicester. Probably swept in because there were so many meetings in Leicester. It's estimated that about 70% of women in Leicester were working. So, um, in what it, jobs, uh, Jess? Boot and shoe, mostly. Yeah. Boot and shoe, yes. Mm. Um, so I think they came to Leicester a lot because they saw it as a, a fertile ground. On March the 4th, she went out um, with two others from Nottingham and uh, took a very circuitous route um, to Sloane Square, trying to throw off the police following her. And eventually she took out a hammer with the other three women, smashed a post office window, which was about nine foot by six. That must have been quite impressive. <laughs> uh, and was arrested for that. This letter is just written on March the 7th, so just after she'd been put on remand. And, uh, She's talking to my dearest Tom and my precious children. I felt rather bad the first day. I think it was caused by the effort to bring oneself up to the point of breaking a window at all. She goes on, say, the clanging of the iron doors and the sound of keys that lock you up in cells, which are dark, and this one has no window that opens at all. Women of a certain upbringing, as these women were mainly, I think they, it was a great shock to the system. The only comfort came from the fact that they were with each other. You know, a lot of the letters from the suffragettes in jail referred to this camaraderie and the fact that, you know, having Mrs. Pankhurst there a lot of the time really cheered their spirits. The charge sheet uh, actually said she assaulted a policeman, she slapped him in the face, Nellie categorically denied this. She said it was beneath her dignity to slap anyone in the face. Looking at the effect of the First World War, did the suffragettes make a difference, do you think? I think it suited Lloyd George to pretend that, oh, women have been working hard in the First World War, and it sort of uh, soothed his ego to, to, to take that. But of course, uh, I think it's, you know, it would, wouldn't have happened without women making sacrifices like that, I don't think. The struggle of British men and women for the vote was put on hold by the First World War. In the East Midlands, the recruiting drive drew patriotic and optimistic crowds. The first Kibworth volunteers had grown up together, played cricket together, the Iliffs, Bromleys, Holyoaks and Colemans had all been in the village since Tudor times. The war fought by communities on whose solidarity the government could depend. I wish we could show you the whole of that, but anyway, final words so is really thanks to you all, thanks to Kibworth for, for making the series so memorable and and so long-lasting in people's uh, opinions. And television's such a transitory, ephemeral medium, but thank you all. And I'll just end with a little story. A year or two after the series first went out, uh, some Kibworth friends went down to London, and they were in Harrods, and, and uh, the shop assistant said, uh, so where are you from? And they said, um, well, we're from Leicestershire. She said, but where are you from? And they said, oh, you, you won't have heard of it. Um, it it's a place called Kibworth. Not THE Kibworth. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Oh.
Okay, uh, we're now going to have a qu question and answer. Michael's going to try and answer your question. So if you have a question, if you put your hand up, I will try and get round to you. You were saying earlier about the, the, the two new estates and if what they'd found possibly, you know, the, with the digging at the estates, the housing estates, what, is there anything particular? Oh, yes, yeah. Um, well, actually, it was only... I, I phoned up Pete Little the other day saying, I'm, going, I'm talking in Kibworth, you know, what's the latest developments? And he said, uh, and it's a lot of stuff, and, uh, you know, I can't say I've digested it properly, but um, most important is that side of... of Kibworth, and there's a lot of Iron Age field patterns, a big circular ringwork, and some uh, what look like housing patterns in the soil. Um, it, it, it's obvious that the Iron Age part of the story is much bigger than, we, than anybody had ever guessed. Uh, and they also found some late Saxon stuff as well. So, uh, but it's published in a variety of sources, and I can't say I've trawled it all, but I've looked at one or two of the maps, and, you know, it's obvious that there's much more to come. That's the really interesting thing. And probably the really important things are underneath Harcourt and Beecham centres, which have been centres of population since before, you know, since before the Romans. Okay, any... Ah, right, I'll come round. We're okay time-wise, are we, Robin? I'm, Sorry? I, I say we're all right time-wise, yes, are we? Yes, we're I had, fine at the moment. I, 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 yeah, I think so. Good. Uh, you mentioned during your talk about remnants of three other mills, as yes. well as the, the mill that's still standing. Yes. Can you tell me where they were? Um, they are mill mounds, not, not um, and I think in the, in the paperback there's a rather lovely map in which I did mark, I did mark the, um, I can probably, can I, check, can I find the, the page of the map now that, let's just have a look. They're only, I remember walking out to one of them, which is here, 18, here we go. I can't remember the name of the road, but um, yeah, it's the road that goes out to Great Glen, the old London road, presumably the A6, because this is an older map, but, um, and there's, There's one of those quite close to the top of Harcourt. What's there on the ground now? I can't remember. The other, there's another mill mound that goes out uh, on the road towards Fleckney, I think. And one has been found recently in the, in the new, in the new um, uh, data that's come out of the housing estate. That there's, a, there's one there. In the exact position, I don't know. But you'd expect each of Harcourt, Beecham and Smeaton Westerby to have mills and, um, you know, possibly two each for the big places because they're quite populous, you know. Kibworth Harcourt alone must have had maybe 500 people in the, um, you know, in the 11th century. It's quite, quite big, I think. So you'd expect mills. Okay, one last question. Sorry, Anybody like to ask it? Woodford. Can you give me the title? Oh, no. Can I remember it? <laughs> can, but he's, he's F. Woodford. And it is, you can get it in a, a little modern paperback photographic reproduction. And it's an absolutely brilliant, brilliant book. Um, um, what's so great about it is it's, it's a, he's looking back at the beginning of the First World War at the Kibworth of his childhood in the 1860s. 
And he goes house by house describing the people who live there. And they, what's so wonderful about it is, is the eccentricity of people. I mean, it's a really, really eccentric com community. I've described it at some length in, in that, simply because as a historical source, I thought it was so wonderful and arresting. You know, the things that are never normally recorded, he records, you know, and uh, it's an unmissable book for anybody interested in, well, more than Kibworth. History of Kibworth, a personal reminiscence. Uh, and it's, it's a absolutely priceless, very funny and interesting. And so do, do, I do recommend that. Any other thoughts? Okay, um, Michael, we'll be going into the church hall to sign books and things, but I think, uh, how can I express my thanks? Uh, if Manchester United have got into the top six, I think Michael would have been a lot happier, but never mind. Um, given up on them. Michael and Rebecca have given their time up completely free to come here tonight. So a very big thank you. But Rebecca, we, if you'd like to come down here, I, we have a little something. And Michael, if you could accept some wine from us, That's just as a kind. token of thanks. Thanks a lot. We might meet again. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you for the money that's been raised for the church yeah, and headway. But if I could ask you once again, Michael Wood and Rebecca, thank you. Thank you.